join me in welcoming our final speaker of the day, Mike Dixon. Unfortunately, this is the last um, session of the day, so I'm going to try and make it fairly interactive. Do you want me to point this up a bit? Um, I'm going to try and make it fairly interactive. This thing behind me is the live searches that are going on uh, through Google and through the systems device um, sort of search bar on the systems device website. And it shows you what people are searching for this minute um, and this second. So if you go onto the website on your phone, you type it in, you'll see it appear behind you um, if anyone wants to uh, sort of sledge me from behind. Um, and what's, what's important about this, we have it in our office in, in London, in the, in the national office, and I've been, uh, sort of one of my goals for this year is to try and get it outside um, the Prime Minister's office in number 10 at his rolling to-do list, um, although I'm having a bit of trouble getting that done. Uh, what this shows, I think, is um, partly what it's like to be in the front line giving advice, as many of you will know, but also it shows the different ways that people use the internet and respond to things. So, uh, one of the things you will see here is a lot of misspelling. You will see some um, people using Google in very different ways. So some people type in very fulsome sentences, some people use natural English, some people type paragraphs in and expect a response to come out of that, some people use keywords. They use things in very different ways. And also, often people use language that isn't the language. Um, it's quite off-putting trying to give a presentation to everyone by uh, looking to the side of it. Um, I'm sort of slightly used to it now. Uh, people also use language that professionals often don't use. So um, one of the things that we see often is um, people will talk about um, the bedroom tax, they won't talk about uh, the thing it's officially called. And so for organisations like us, when we're trying to reflect users' language, that's an incredibly important and different thing. Um, so I'm going to come back to this at some point. I've got two things where I have to switch over on the laptop because it's, it's a little bit online, some of the stuff. Um, so if you'll excuse me, I'm going to nip down there, nip back up, and nip down there, and nip back up twice during this presentation. But I promise I'm not running away out of fear. Um, I'm just going to do one now. Uh, we'll talk amongst ourselves. <laughs> it'll take two seconds. No, I didn't see the work from it. Does any, uh, let's try and zoom out a tiny bit. Does anyone know what this is a picture of? No, right, it's not going to work on this. So, so I want, I'm going to zoom out um, from this, um, and I want you to kind of try and shout out when you recognise what this is. Has anyone got it? Yeah? <laughs> Does anyone want to have a guess what this is? It's a march in America, isn't it? A march in America we've got over here? It's not the anti-austerity march in Hull. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So you're right. It's a, it's um, Obama's inauguration, um, which is um, just one of this one. <laughs> So, so this, um, so this is, um, so I'm normally slightly slicker than that because I don't have to be in two places at once. Um, so this is, um, this is Obama's inauguration. And it's one of the most amazing photos that's ever been taken because it's 1,400 photos stitched together in one, t in one place. So the thing that I originally showed you are the people just here. And you can zoom in and out of this. You can see what all of those people are and what they're doing. Um, and uh, there are quite a lot of people in that photo that probably didn't realize that they were going to be in a big photo um, and doing some quite strange things. Um, so the Bible's inauguration, what else is it a photo of? 
So this is the number of people that walk through the doors of Citizens Advice Bureau every year in England and Wales um, as one picture. Um, which, which, and this is the only picture I've ever found. So it's 1.3 million people, and you can see every single one of their faces. Which, if you kind of want to picture the the sort of what is going on and the number of people that need help and are prepared to queue or prepared to go to a citizen's advice, prepared to walk up, and also the number of people who are involved in helping other people to get to find solutions to their problem. Every single one of these people has a conversation with someone that helps them sort something out. So. I'm going to do two more. Um, this will. This is last time. I think this should now work. So, this is the number of people that um, walk through face to face. Um, this is the number of people that phone us, and this is the number of people that use the online uh, website. So that gives you a sense of 22 million people, what they actually look like if you put them on one page. Um, and uh, one thing that this has helped Systems Advice uh, do and understand, and one of the things I wanted to talk about today, because I realise you would have had a lot of practical stuff around um, brilliant partnership working and hearing the, um, the work that you've just heard about on GPs is incredibly important for us nationally because it's done so well here. Um, it's about how you learn from giving services to lots of people and how that, that uh, is different in time of austerity. So have you had a lot of charts today? So I, I only saw the last three presentations which didn't really have many in. I'm going to do one, okay, I'm going to do one chart. Which is, which is this one. So this is the one chart that wasn't in the budget, that is the chart that should have been in the budget. So this is, um, this is the impact of the budget on deciles of income. So the poorest deciles on the left, the richest deciles on the right. And it's the net effect of the budget. So if you're in the poorest uh, uh, decile, you lose about 800 quid. If you're in the richest decile, you lose about 400 quid. Um, and that is the overall spread of what the impact of the budget measures, measures did. So overall, about £4 billion increase in the national um, living wage that was announced and about a £12 billion reduction in welfare, welfare spending. Because people don't really understand how tax credits impacts on them, but you can imagine a pay rise, um, the whole story in the budget was pay rise, but a lot of the impact was less money for the poorest. And if you look at the impact of, um, of every budget, um, under um, this government and the last government, it has looked the same broad story. So, um, I'm not making anywhere political point, um, but what is important is that we understand how this is, how the amount of money in the economy, where it's going, what that will mean for the people who rely on services most. So, this distributional reshaping happens in every single budget at the moment and is incredibly important in terms of understanding the way that we need to respond to services. So, within that, the, the graph that I'm not going to show you because it's in some ways too depressing is, um, is uh, how far through we are in terms of spending cuts. So, we are just under halfway through the impact of spending cuts on all the budgets that pay for all of advice. So the cuts that we faced as a sector in the last five years, uh, we are less than halfway through the total cuts that will happen over 10 years. So as, as a way of um, presenting a challenge to us as a sector about how we respond, we've got to be even more inventive, even more collaborative, even more imaginative about how we respond, and design services that respond acutely to how people actually behave. Um, so I want to talk just quickly about how people behave and how you can design services in that way. Um, I was going to talk a bit about a very general practice, which is a report on GP surgeries, but um, the facts that I had in it uh, um, were beautifully illustrated just now, so I won't, I won't dwell on that, apart from to say it's a fantastic service. I'm trying to put people to copy it everywhere across the country. Um, so, responsive, psychologically real services work better. And what I mean by this is um, we can design services that work very, very well, um, when we understand some simple rules of thumb about how people uh, behave and operate. Um, so if you just look at that for, you know, so five, ten seconds more. Um, yes. um, were there more women or men on that page? Can you put up your hand if you thought there were more men? 
So no one. Can you, can you put up your hand if you thought there were more women on the page? Okay. So if you count them, there are more men. <laughs> so, so the reason is, um, is this, which is um, we judge as human beings the probability of an event based on how easy it is to imagine. So if you look at um, that list of men, and I hope none of them are in the room, they're kind of, they're kind of a bit boring. Um, so as uh, compared to the women on that list, who you can imagine, you, can, um, you know a lot about, um, they're often quite kind of iconic um, people that you can imagine easily. And that, that constantly makes us overemphasize the probability of something happening if we can imagine it. And that has some important implications that I'll go to in a minute. Um, uh, and, and you might think that the way that the budget was presented was very, very clever on this because you can imagine a national living wage pay increase because you can, a wage is quite an easy thing to imagine, whereas tax benefit changes that in very complicated ways reduce your income is quite hard to imagine. So it feels like when you hear big tax, tax benefit cuts um, and changes to means testing that sound quite complicated and a pay rise, everyone thinks pay rise. Um, so, do this one as well. So, um, this is the sort of British Bake Off tribute. So, um, can you uh, sort of work out? So, I want um, half of you to put up your hands and you to be in pairs. Does that make sense? So, grab the person next to you and agree who, which of you is going to put up your hand. And then one of you put up your hands. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. So you can put your hands down, but remember, remember who you are if you put your hands up. So if you've got your hands up, or had your hand up, you can imagine that Mary Berry walks through the door at the back as the final guest speaker. And, um, and just before she comes on, she's um, got a tray full of her beautiful cookies that she's just baked. They're really delicious, still warm, lovely. She hands them out to everyone that had their hand up. Um, and she says, you wonderful people, you really deserve a cookie. I know it's getting close to the end of the conference. Um, I've also got a lovely warm cup of tea here that you can have with your cookie. That's going to be delicious. Um, to all of those who didn't um, have their hands up, you don't get one, sorry. Um, so what I'd like you to do, just for one minute, is agree. Um, uh, I want those of you with your hands up, that had your hands up, you've got that delicious cookie and that cup of tea. Can you work out how much the person next to you would have to pay you for you to give them that cookie and that cup of tea? Okay? Don't tell the other person, don't tell the other person, it's really important. Okay? So, so wait, hold on, hold on, I haven't quite finished yet. I haven't quite finished yet. I haven't quite finished yet, sorry. So, so the other person, the other, the other person, can you work out how much you'd be prepared to pay them for that, that cup of tea and that biscuit? Okay? And now I want you to agree between you how much you will pay to give them that biscuit. So I'll give you one minute to agree on a price. <laughs> Um, so can people tell me, can you shout out roughly what was the price you agreed to sell Mary Berry's cookie to your neighbour? We can have some? Nothing. 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 Free. You're all... You're all Somebody all deserves it. All yeah. So did, who, can you put your hands up if you gave away your cookie for free? Okay, you are out of the experiment. <laughs> you, are, you are a completely unrepresentative human being. <laughs> so people that, that didn't, didn't give the cookie away for free, um, uh, what kind of price did you want to charge for it? Ten pounds. Ten pounds? Fifty pence. A five or fifty p? One fifty. A pound? Okay. One fifty. So the ten pounds, ten pound cookie, you got fleeced to have that one. Um, so, did you find, in general, that the, apart from those um, uh, purebred Corbyn supporting socialists, um, uh, did you, did you find that the person who originally had it, did they want to charge more for it than the other person was prepared to pay, or did they want to charge less? We've got more. Can you put your hands up if they wanted more for it? They really wanted to hold on to that cookie. Less than you were prepared to pay? Right, well, okay. I'll, I'll give up on this exercise. <laughs> So, is that, what, what happens when you normally do that um, in, a, in a room, perhaps not after an austerity conference, is, um, <laughs> is that people who have the cookie want a lot more money than the people that don't have the cookie. Because if you've got something, you want to keep it, even if, if you didn't have it, you wouldn't want it that much. And this is an incredibly important thing for advice to try and understand. So, there are loads of these things. Where they're puristics, they're kind of mental rules of thumb, they're about how people operate. 
Um, and they're very, very important. So availability, as a, as a kind of way that we judge probability, meant that the Chancellor could present wages while giving away um, a small wage increase with a big tax cut, and it came across as a big wage increase. Um, so loss aversion, um, this is the thing that we've just done on Mary Berry's cookie. It's, it's kind of fun if you're doing with cookies. If you're doing with social housing, it's why people don't want to move house. Um, if you're doing, um, there's something called anchoring, which is about um, people judge situations by the comparison to the current situation, not to do with a kind of blank sheet of paper. So if you're doing budgeting with someone, it's much easier to talk to them about what is the change from your current circumstance, then let's do a kind of uh, zero-based budget for you. Um, on commitment escalation, I think we're all very familiar with this. Um, so commitment escalation is uh, if you put a bit of money into it, you probably put a bit more into it, and a bit more into it, and a bit more into it, partly because you don't want to admit you're wrong, and partly because a kind of little bit more might work. That is what payday loans have made a fortune from as a heuristic. Um, so familiarity, um, uh, in quite a, I think it's in Derbyshire, um, uh, the GPs all have a prescription pad um, that is an advice prescription. So it says, um, it looks like a normal prescription pad, the GP can write on it and say go to your local citizen's advice or your other local, there are other advice providers available. Um, <laughs> go to your local advice provider and, um, and tell them this and tell them I sent you and you can do this. It makes no difference at all turning up at a citizen's advice with that bit of paper, but it feels like a legitimate thing to be given by a GP. It feels like a transaction you're familiar with and it legitimizes going to get the advice. Costs no one anything, but massively improves referral and take up. Um, and uh, uh, I won't do social proof. Yeah, you can all Google it. Um, so the thing that I kind of wanted to say about advice and dealing with advice in austerity, and this last thing that I'll say, is um, we've got to be really smart about it in the future. So there are loads of brilliant things that go on, and when they work really well, it's because you on the front line delivering advice, know how people actually behave. And one of, the, um, one of the things that is hardest if you're in Whitehall is knowing how people actually behave. So um, one of the reasons um, that politicians read the Daily Mail a lot uh, is because they've got so many journalists. So if you're in number 10, it's very difficult to understand what's actually happening in the country because the ONS will sort of tell you, but they'll tell you six months later and it will still be qualified and there won't have any stories in it. Or you can read the Daily Mail and there's a sidebar of shame on the right, which is quite entertaining um, in, on the online version. And um, the, the other thing, it's got lots and lots of human interest stories and it tells you kind of what's happening in the country much more richly than the Director General who lives in Oxford and has just driven in his chauffeur-driven car um, and is the person you're going to talk to. So one of the things that advice agencies can do brilliantly, I'll, I'll sort of end with this, is, is give really um, acute uh, insight into how people are really behaving and designing services around people are really behaving. And, and when we come together as advice services, it works incredibly well. So the example that I'd give on that is around payday lenders. So uh, we collected from our, the money advice services that we run and the ones that lots of other organisations run, lots of evidence about how the payday lending wasn't working. Uh, the Continuous Payment Authority that I imagine quite a lot of you are familiar with, where people could take money continually out of people's bank accounts again and again and again. And um, uh, went to the FCA and said, this is a, this is a real problem. And then um, there was some legislation passed that um, made the, the um, that clamped down on the rules that they could uh, lend under. And then we've got something in Systems Advice now that is a bit like the sort of Blue Peter totalizer. So I, I don't know if I'm allowed to tell you what the actual figure is on top of the totalizer, but when um, a Systems Advice Bureau or a partner collects evidence that a payday lender has breached the lending conditions, we add it to the totalizer for that uh, lending, for that lender. When it hits a certain um, kind of threshold, uh, we hand that pile to the FCA and the FCA removes their license. So um, it's become quite a fun game for advisors in the Systems Advice Bureau, which is if you can add to the totalizer, you can get the lenders, uh, license stripped. I think it's 32 lenders have had their licenses stripped now because of organizations working together to collect the evidence and knowing how people actually operate and behave. So uh, probably quite a lot of what this conference is focused on is 
is um, how to work together on delivering services. The other thing that I'd really like to highlight, just as the last thing, is working together on gathering evidence, understanding how people change, and being able to change policy and practice in doing that, because you really can get stuff changed. And there are you know, hundreds of thousands fewer payday lender loans in the market because of the individual stuff that advisors across the country have collected from Citizens Advice and lots of other organisations. So that's what I want to say. We've done low, well I was asked to say this, so I'll be going off my brief, sorry. You don't have to clap me after this, it's fine. Is, um, is we did, we've done a lot of research in systems advice about impact. Um, so the impact of what we do, we've done all the kind of modeling of all the numbers, built loads of spreadsheets and graphs and models. Um, and we have, um, we have two kind of challenges in our impact work. Um, one is um, uh, people love the impact stuff we produce, and it makes a very good um, case to funders. We've got two problems with it. One is um, uh, um, it's when you gather the evidence you need for, for, for impact work and for funders, um, you are slowing down the advice transaction with a client. And the more, the more information you collect about the impact, the worse the service is that you give. And there is just a direct trade-off on that that we have to be very careful about. We do need to understand it and we need to make sure it works really well, but it's not straightforward. Um, and then the second thing, and this is the sort of positive, is um, when we first did it, and I imagine this is true for a lot of advice agencies, um, the numbers looked really, really good in a kind of unrealistically good way. And so what we've had to do is basically cut all of the assumptions to the most conservative assumption you could possibly make about advice and its impact to be even slightly credible. And we took it through um, various economists in um, various government departments. And they were like, no, you're being way too conservative about these, uh, these um, assumptions you're making underneath. And, um, and then we kind of added back in their assumptions, showed them the stuff, and they were like, yeah, I think you should come back to the sort of unrealistic numbers. Um, because advice is having such a huge impact at the moment about how people's lives are being changed. And I think everyone that's been involved with this should feel incredibly proud because these, are, these happen to be numbers for citizens advice, but they're numbers for advice, really. So I, I want to give a round of applause for you because that's your work, not mine. Great, thank you.